everybody. Happy Thursday. I'm Brandon Busty, president of University Partners of Kaplan, and thanks for joining our latest edition of Bold Leaders in Learning. Uh, I'm delighted to have author Melissa Korn with us today. Um, I don't think there's anybody that's on this feed who hasn't heard about the Operation Varsity Blues college admission scandal that happened, um, but you may not yet have read the full story about this in her book, Unacceptable. Um, I had a chance to read it about a week and a half ago, Melissa. It is, um, it's an incredible story. Uh, reads a bit like it should be a movie, which uh, I know uh, you're probably hopeful that that could be the case too. But um, listen, I would love to just have you start, uh, tell people a little bit about you beyond the fact that you're uh, the author and, and regular writer at Wall Street Journal. Um, and then just maybe tell us the, the, the headlines of the book beyond what people have learned about from uh, from the articles they might have read over the past couple of years. Sure. Well, thank you for having me, first of all, um, and for the kind words about the book. So I, as Brandon said, I uh, was co-author of the book Unacceptable, came out last summer. I'm a higher education reporter for the Wall Street Journal based in New York, although I guess location bases now don't really matter much in our virtual world. Uh, I've been at the journal or uh, since about 2011. Before that, I was with Dow Jones Newswires covering uh, alcohol, tobacco, for-profit colleges, student lenders, and a couple of other highly regulated industries. And I've been, I started at Dow Jones in 2007. So I've been in various parts of the higher ed reporting space for a while now, uh, which is why when this story broke, I, you know, jumped right on it and was partnered with a colleague, Jennifer Levitz, to start covering it for the paper. And it very quickly turned into a book um, just because there's so many wild stories in it. And also with my background in higher ed could talk about the context, right? Why these parents possibly thought they needed to go to these lengths to get their kids into these particular schools. So the, the bare bones of the scheme, I can give you that for a little bit. Um, Rick Singer was this college counselor uh, based first in Sacramento and then Southern California. He had a legitimate counseling business, but he also had this menu of illicit options. Uh, uh, one, one prong of the scheme had to do with testing where he would pay off a test site administrator to allow a proctor, whom he also paid, to go in and uh, fix a kid's test scores on SAT or ACT. So, correct wrong answers after the fact, or sometimes feed the right score to the kid if the kid was in on it. The other prong had to do with athletic admissions, athletic recruiting. Uh, Singer would pitch his clients' kids as star athletes in kind of lower profile sports. Uh, and the family would make a donation through his charity, send some money as a donation directly to the school as well sometimes. Uh, and the kid would get in because recruited athletes are admitted at a much higher rate than anyone else, uh, pretty much anyone else. And it's uh, about as close to a guarantee as you can get at some of these really selective schools. And the scheme went on for uh, at least since 2011. We know there's some indications in 2007, 2008, uh, and really probably would still be going on had there not been this completely unrelated securities fraud case. Yeah, that was that was. I mean, your your comment about wild stories. I mean, it it is a whole series of wild stories with big names. I mean, many people are familiar with some of the celebrity names, but like big names. I mean, an owner of a vineyard, a hedge fund manager, right? Like there was just. I mean, every kind of person from every prominent role. It seems like there is a version of it, but that that was one of my surprises. I'd read a lot of the news stories, but I'd never really, uh, or it didn't register like what actually broke this scandal, right? How did it get discovered? And to realize that it was a totally unrelated securities fraud investigation that detected it. Like my first question is, would this all still be going on were it not for that? I mean, what, what's your take? So the testing thing probably would not have been going on. And there's, you know, you can't help but joke that if these families had only waited a year or two, right? The I must get that SAT score thing wouldn't have been an issue because so many schools went test optional. Right. Uh, but I, I do think that even this, this parts of the scheme probably would have still been going on um, at least to some extent uh, had it not been taken down uh, in this kind of accidental way. And even now that this scheme has been you know, shut down, there are others. 
a couple of my colleagues, one of my colleagues and someone at ProPublica uh, wrote, uh, I guess it was over last was summer of 2019 about a case where a counselor in Chicago area was encouraging students to um, be uh, parents to uh, give up guardianship of their kids so the kids could get more financial aid. And uh, these were, again, families who could afford a private college counselor to advise them to do this. It's legal, it's questionable, but it's legal. So there's always gonna be these, you know, there's people are always gonna find shortcuts. Yeah, I mean, there's so many, um, I'll call them loopholes, shortcuts, right? The side door, the back door, there was a lot of terminology in the book about, you know, different strategies, right? It runs from one that's been going forever in higher ed, family makes a really, really big donation and like, oh, hey, here's my son's application. Could you, you know, and it's not a guarantee, but obviously uh, drastically increases the odds. And then there's these side door schemes that Singer came up with of bribing coaches and assistant coaches and, you know, paying off, uh, you know, people to take tests for students. I mean, but like there were, there were all kinds of other pieces in there, like getting uh, doctor's notes to say that they needed extra time on an exam because of a disability. Um, you know, even you're hearing stories too of like people who are moving during their kid's senior year to North Dakota, establishing residency for the year so that when they apply to Harvard or wherever it is, yeah. they're the one, you know, of, of 10 students from North Dakota fly. Like, so I heard calls like, that sparse country, actually. It, it, yeah. They honestly do. There's parts of the country that, you know, they're just, they don't get a lot of applications. So yeah, that's a good way to stand out is move to North Dakota. Right. And, you know, it's just, uh, as I mentioned to you, you know, I, I read Jeff Salingo's new book on kind of a year inside college admissions right around the same time that I read yours. And, you know, his is like the insider view of, I'll call it all the legal, but not really, you know, um, I don't know, things that that are, I think a lot of people still find to be really, um, you know, distasteful in the college admissions process. You know, yours was a deep dive into the, you know, the illegal and really, really shady activities going on there. But like, in a way, you know, there's a fine line on that. And it's, just tell me a it's little all, bit more about that. Yeah, it's all on a spectrum of behavior, right? There's the fairly innocuous things or what many people consider to be innocuous these days, getting um, a private tutor, Right, paying for private tennis lessons uh, above and beyond what they do at the high school, um, have being able to afford family trips uh, so that the kid is exposed to just is more worldly, or paying for them to go somewhere to do a volunteer program, uh, having the resources so that the high schooler doesn't need to work after school but can go pursue some side passion project. Uh, these are all like kind of small uh, privileges that certain populations have. And then you've got, you know, move up a notch to, okay, people who are able to afford a very large donation, which again is not a guarantee and can be quite expensive. And you move further down that path to, uh, okay, maybe fudging a few things on your application, putting down that you're president instead of vice president of a club or mm -hmm. marking off that you're a certain ethnicity when you're not, which is something else that Rick Singer encouraged some of his clients to do. Uh, you know, being able to say that your legacy is a leg up, being able to say that you're a VIP because you know so-and-so is a leg up. And then you kind of keep going down to this actually lying, cheating, stealing uh, level of behavior. Right, like taking photos of your kid playing water polo in your uh, backyard pool when they don't actually play water polo, right? Or sticking your kid's face on a picture of someone else playing that sport. And as we had one, the high school principal um, of one of the students whose picture was used said, you know, you just stole a life, right? Those, right. those We checked down a couple of the kids whose photos were used and I think when you think about who the victims are in this whole case, right? Legally speaking, the universities and the testing companies were, the testing organizations were the victims, but because they were the ones defrauded of property in a way. But the real victims are the people who didn't get into these colleges because these kids did, or the ones who, you know, they're just not even, these schools aren't even on their radar because of the way the system is set up and so focused on certain populations of high school students and certain you know, very wealthy communities on the coasts of the country. 
Right. I'm going to ask, I know those of you who are with us live, um, I'm sure that you have several questions you might want to ask Melissa. So please type us some of those in the comments and, um, and we'll get to them. And as you're thinking about those, um, you know, maybe uh, just comment on, you know, you at the end of the book, you know, you started to, you know, last chapter is kind of like, has anything really changed? You know, what, what kind of reform is going to come from this? And you, you reflected on uh, your visit to the NACAC conference and how colleges were reacting to this. So just to take us into that uh, a little bit. Yeah, I tend to be fairly cynical uh, just as a human being. So I don't think I expected college admissions to completely change because of the scandal, but I was surprised by how little did change. Uh, so I went to the NACA conference in Louisville in 2019 and you know, I, I discussed it in the book, but there was this refrain from so many of the people there that this was not an admission scandal, right? They didn't want to own it. It was a sports scandal. It was a coaching scandal. It was a testing scandal. It was a few bad actors, but don't blame us for this. Like nobody in an admissions office got charged. So we're clear. And I think that in some ways just missed the point of perhaps nobody was charged. So you're not criminally responsible, but you still created the system that exists today and allowed something like this to thrive and allowed these students and these parents to get so caught up in the prestige and the brand names and this very short list of what they deem to be acceptable destination colleges. Uh, and you can't completely uh, just wave off responsibility for all of that. Yeah, I think, you know, that was one of my takeaways, too, is that there was just very little um, acknowledgement, you know, not of like outright guilt or, you know, uh, responsibility, but acknowledgement by universities that, you know, they they probably could and should be doing a lot more to prevent this kind of thing from happening. Right. Like it has given higher ed a, a, a serious black eye. And, you know, like there was already a lot of, you know, I mean, there's been growing angst about higher ed from a number of perspectives, like declining confidence in higher education. And it's linked to a whole host of stuff, rising prices, right? Student loan debt linked to that. Uh, you know, it's now a partisan issue in terms of how uh, higher, the value of higher ed is looked at from a Republican or a Democrat uh, view from a party perspective. And then, you, you know, you throw in this scandal, right? And it just makes a lot of people go, you know, See, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's elite, it's elitist, it's, um, you know, it's unfair, right? And so I'm curious, you know, that, that your take now, you know, we're, we're a little ways removed from it. You know, it's, it's still in the press to some degree, but like, you know, what, what kind of lingering bitterness is there going to be about this? Like, is it still out there? Do you hear it from parents and students and others? Yeah, I think the bitterness is real. It is, it is long lasting. Uh, but it's bitterness about a few different things. One is this idea that we always knew the system was rigged. It was never a pure meritocracy and this just proves it. And see, you know, prove my point sort of attitude about it. Other people are really upset that, you know, they could never even think to give their kids those sorts of advantages. And the families involved in this case seem to have just taken it all for granted. Just the entitlement and the privilege that's so ingrained in every element of this scandal. Uh, I think there's also a lot of anger that schools, uh, that colleges do kind of perpetuate this anxiety and the media also, you know, we are responsible for writing about just how hard it was to get into Harvard this year and all of that. And we probably need to do a better job noting that that is a tiny slice of higher ed and often is not representative of what's going on in the rest of the, in the rest of the sector. So there's a lot of ill will and a lot of hard feelings, a lot of hurt feelings, a lot of suspicion. Um, and I, I'm curious to see when some of the parents go on trial, those who have pleaded not guilty or scheduled to go on trial uh, later this year, you know, as, as so some of these stories kind of come back up um, and feel more fresh, you know, we're gonna start to see a lot of that anger and bitterness again. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you hit in a lot of ways because you you tell uh, a story behind a lot of the people in, I mean, and there's many people who are involved in this scandal, you know, the parents and, you know, why they made these decisions. You know, these are, these are parents that they, they were able to give their kid every leg up and yet they still felt the need to do this, right? And, um, but it was interesting because, um, you know, like 
it's hard to have, frankly, I think, sympathy or empathy for the people who engage in this, right? They're already wealthy. They already have this advantage. Um, and I think you noted that, like, in terms of some of the strategies in, in these trials, right? Like, you're a defense attorney. It's kind of hard to say, oh, my poor client, you know, like, what? Like, so... Well, um, tried. <laughs> yeah, oh, they did. Yeah, in pathetic ways, as you note in the book. I mean, really, really pathetic ways uh, that just made it, made it worse. And in fact, in the early days, uh, several folks got much more leniency from the judges by just coming out and saying, we were a jerk. Like, we, you know, we, we you know, and just let, let it that, right? So um, anyway, it, it, it just, uh, I, I don't know that anybody really has any sympathy or empathy for this kind of stuff yet. You know, there is still this frenzy out there in the, you know, upper class elite private school, you know, frenzied parent and communities, right? Like, and, and you made the point like this year, applications are up at the top tier universities more than they've ever been. Um, you know, it's just so like, I, I feel like we're, we're still hurling towards this thing. It, it hasn't, it hasn't come down a notch yet. Yeah, I feel like it hasn't, well, it hasn't led to this kind of overhaul of the system. And there, are, there's really no incentive for many universities to change things the way they are. Maybe this year when their applications are up 40, 50% and their admissions officers are overworked, they'll rethink things, but probably not because they can now boast that their admit rate is that much lower, uh, right? So there, there's some strange incentives in here to continue to goose the numbers. Um, I do think that it's, you know, we can cast blame on the universities. We can also cast blame on some of the high schools uh, for helping to perpetuate this frenzy as well. That, um, you know, this idea that we want our kids to go off to whatever school is a great fit for them, but then on their website, they really only highlight, you know, a dozen destinations that they're really proud of. Uh, you know, and they should be doing, they should be doing better than that. Um, you know, and tamping down some of that anxiety around that just handful of schools. Parents involved certainly to blame. Uh, you know, the ki no kids were charged, and we spoke to one of the students who was, I guess, a beneficiary of this. Uh, and he said, you know, I probably should have spoken up more. I should have voiced my opposition to my dad getting so involved in this whole thing. And sure, we can put some blame on the kids. There's there's so, plenty of blame to cast around. One, and I don't think we let anyone easy let let off anyone easy in the book, but we do show that these the parents like. They're human beings who some of their faults and some of their, the, the issues they had and some of the challenges they had in parenting are very relatable. And that's quite unsettling for me as a parent, right? To see some of myself in some of their actions when their kids were really young. Um, you know, okay, how far would you go for your own kid is the ultimate question for it. Right. Yeah, and that's interesting because you're right. There, there, there is a degree of relatability, right? These are, you know, in some cases, these were parents who, you know, were separated, and you know, one parent was, you know, kind of driving the process, and they wanted to do, you know, the right thing by their kid, the right, you know, so it was all for their kid, and they got caught up in this frenzy, and you know, it's it's like a lot of these things, you know, in this admissions process, there's fine lines, like where. Where is it, you know, kind of distasteful? When does it become unethical? When is it illegal, right? And, and so, you know, I think we're still very much in that world. I think there's parents in this frenzied category that are still locked in that uh, vortex. And so in, in my opinion, right, like, you know, what, what, what reason do we have to believe that, that something like this isn't happening right now as we're, as we're talking, right? Like, what's, yeah. what's your view on the odds that this isn't happening in some form right now? I'm sure it is in some form and whether it's again, that kind of slightly more mild version of just exaggerating in your application versus out and out fraud, bribery, racketeering. Uh, I don't know, but certainly there are things on spectrum. People are always going to try to find way, find shortcuts, right? As long as there is this precious commodity, this uh, spot at a particular university that comes with prestige and connections and a path to, you know, the elite class uh, is perceived to have all of those things, people are going to go to great lengths to gain access to that. Yeah, there's a, you know, there's a few things I, you know, I was reflecting on from, you know, another book I read this year, uh, Michael Sandel's Tyranny of Merit. Um, you know, those who haven't read it, I highly recommend it. You know, he, he talks about 
meritocracy more broadly, but like one of the things that he really critiques in the book is U.S. higher ed and very specifically elite higher ed. And um, and he you know he wrote in the book one of the one of the things he talked about was what he called the the last acceptable prejudice in America, and that was of the educated uh, to the uneducated. And it you know it, it made me think about you know college versus no college, right? The emphasis that our country has in a well-intentioned manner tried to put on college completion goals, right? But the unintended consequence of that has been a belittling uh, or a feeling of belittling to those who don't have a college degree or a college pedigree as if they're, you know, they're not, you know, they don't, they don't matter, right? In the grand scheme of things. So there's this, there's this bigger tension of the college versus the uneducated tension that, that Sandel talks about. And then it's especially pronounced at the elite institutions who, as you noted, right, like they, they base their prestige. Uh, yes, they've been around for a long time, many of them, but based on how selective they are, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, so that, I think you're right. Like this is a microcosm story uh, of something that was taken to an extreme, but that's an issue that is relatable to everybody, whether that you're on the, the, the losing end of this, you know, college thing or on the winning end because you took advantage of every possible leverage you could get. Right, it reflects on so many of these themes that we discuss constantly in American society, right? About meritocracy, about fairness, access, opportunity, uh, the haves and the have nots. And it touches on all of those things, even though it is about ultimately a very small kind of type of person, a, a very small slice of society. Yeah. I go back to a lot of the research that that I was involved with uh, when I was at Gallup, right? And you know, one of the one of the big things that came from the Gallup Purdue Index study was, you know, when it comes to long term uh, life outcomes, right? Whether you looked at that as a career dimension or uh, an overall life well being thriving dimension, you know, th there really isn't any difference by the type of college that a graduate you know graduated from, right? We we've always believed that oh. If you graduate from the Ivy League, you know you're you know you're going to be better off in so many different ways. And um, and the reality is, in that research, there was no difference by uh, by by type of institution. And in fact, on some of these indicators uh, about the quality of the experience, um, Ivy League graduates were among the lowest on saying they had professors who cared about them as a person, that they had a mentor who encouraged their goals and dreams. Um, you know, which are really critical experiences that, that, that buoy a graduate later in life in multiple dimensions. And then one of the other studies that was done was on um, the, the, the price of a, uh, an institution. There's no relationship in the ratings of the quality of education by alumni to the price of the institution, right? So this, you know, look, there are high, high price institutions that get high quality ratings. There are also low priced ones that get very high quality rates and, and vice versa. But the point is, there's not a real formula that the more expensive the school you go to, the better the experience is going to be. And like, so even though there's data that suggests that, I don't know that anybody really wants to believe that, right? No. And I mean, the, the Gallup you know, data shows like it's not where you go, it's how you go, right? It's, it's what you do when you're there and what activities you're involved in and all of that. But if, if a family has a choice at the same price point to do that at, you know, an Ivy plus school or a state school, many of them are still going to choose the Ivy plus school because it's an Ivy plus school, because right. it is a sorting mechanism, right? Ex admission to one of those schools uh, indicates to future employers that you are kind of of a certain level, whether or not that's true. Uh, and that's just the way it's been for a very long time. So people will as we had one person in the book put it, you know, parents will ca crawl through glass to get their kids into those schools. Yeah, and, and, uncomfortable. and there's a lot of there's a lot of young students who would do the same thing, right? I mean, whether their parents have that ambition for them and with them, that you know, that's that's the reality. So, you know, I, I you know, I, I struggle with like whether we'll ever really you know break that kind of cycle. On the other hand, though, I do think I'm encouraged by a couple things. You know, one is that you know one of the many impacts of this pandemic is that I really do believe parents and students are becoming much more astute in terms of being education consumers, right? They're starting to uh, think very carefully about the value, right? And, and this, you know, was in part of like, I'm paying full tuition for a residential experience and this is a Zoom class, like not cool, 
but like they're 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 getting deeper and more involved in all this, dissecting it more. They're thinking about the return on investment, and quite frankly, there are some incredible value colleges and universities out there that might not have the elite brand name, but are worth every penny and then some. You can leave without large amounts of student debt. You can get great personal experience, all kinds of things. And we also know there's a growing and maybe much faster growing than anything in higher ed college alternative, right? High quality boot camps, employers who are creating their own credentials like the Google certificate. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to touch on that a little bit because one of the you know, pieces of research I wrote about last year was um, this finding that um, Americans value a Google internship over a Harvard degree when they are asked about the best path to a good job for their kid. Now, I mean, Google obviously is more selective than Harvard, right? If you actually look at the math of how many people apply to Google and get accepted. <laughs> so there's, there's a little bit of this like, you know, uh, you know, selectivity thing going on there. But tell me your thoughts on, um, you know, these, these alternative college routes, right? Like, are, are they really going to become more popular? Do you see a, the potential of the parents and students who are in this hyper competitive landscape to start looking at those options as something that would be really attractive? So I, you know, looking into my crystal ball here, I think that the four year residential college experience will not entirely disappear, um, but it will not be the chosen path for as many students, whether it's because they see better alternatives or they just don't see the value in that experience anymore. Uh, you know, we, we've seen even this year, uh, people who were supposed to go off to four-year schools, uh, but it was going to be online, they didn't want to do it online, or if they had to do it online, they might as well pay less money. So instead, they, you know, started at a community college, spoke to plenty of freshmen who went that route, and then they'll transfer somewhere after. But just, they were, as you said, they were much more thoughtful consumers. And I think uh, as we continue to get more data through the college scorecard, Department of Education, you know, you see more and more information about outcomes as more families start to understand that data and really hopefully the nuances of it, right? That price tag, that their sticker price does not equal cost um, or average debt is not the same as debt for students like me. Uh, as you kind of dig into some of that, there, there will continue to be more discussions about the value of that more traditional degree versus a hybrid or online or not a bachelor's degree at all, but kind of a more stackable credentials. Uh, and I think those are catching on in more, certain industries more than others. You know, uh, I, I don't know that uh, it will catch on in all industries ever, but uh, it's certainly the appetite is there in more and more sectors. Yeah. I mean, I thought about it, like you say, okay, like, why do you care about getting into a great prestigious college, right? Well, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a pelt you're going to have on your wall. And, you know, it, 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 I get all those pieces, but it's so that I can get that prestigious job at that prestigious company, right? And, you know, so like, I want to get into the Ivy League because I want to be in investment banking and I want to work at Goldman Sachs or whatever. If you start to see programs where you can go, go pro early, as I'll call it, to Goldman Sachs or Google or whatever, you know, I do think those are going to be uh, as prestigious a path, you know, not today, but, you know, in the future for for students who say, yeah, I'd rather just get, you know, get right to it. And uh, I agree with you. I think there's still going to be a core market for the four year residential college experience, but it's 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 shrinking because of the population age demographic. And I think there is going to be a population of traditional age students who are just going to say, you know what? I'll do it entirely online. I'll live at home. I'll work while I'm doing it. You know, I'll manage it as a debt-free model or, you know, all the other, you know, kind of components that come with it. And um, so, you know, I think that'll take some, some pressure off it. But uh, I, I hinted at the beginning, um, as I read the book, I thought to myself, when is this going to be a movie or a documentary? Can you just tell us if anything is in the works? Yeah, so the book was optioned uh, for a TV miniseries by Annapurna, the production company. Uh, so a script is in front of a, a network right now and not sure what will develop from it, uh, but it's pretty exciting and pretty cool to kind of get a glimpse into that industry about which I know nothing else. I'm not writing the script, but uh, I get to kind of peek at it. 
That's pretty cool. Well, uh, great job on this. I mean, it was a ton of investigative journalism, interviewing. It sounds like you traveled and, you know, we're all over the place. I don't know how you pulled it off, but um, thank you for doing it. It was a, you know, richly insightful book and, uh, and uh, appreciate you being on the show. For those of you who want to know uh, about next week, I'm going to have Andy Chan, the Vice President of Career and Personal Development from Wake Forest, join me. So uh, look forward to that. And Melissa, thank you again. For those of you who've joined, make sure you get a copy of the book. It's a great read. Thanks so much. I'm excited to uh, tune into next session. That sounds like a fun one. <laughs> Definitely. Well, thank you so much. Have a great week.